read it out loud together. So let's stand as we read God's Word. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 31 to 36. It says this, He who comes from above is above all. He who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies, and no one receives his witness. He who has received his witness has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. One who believes in the Son has eternal life. But one who disobeys the Son won't see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Let's pray, shall we? Father, this morning again, I'm just thankful for your word. Thank you for this gospel. What a great message. What a great portion of scripture to inform us all about Jesus Christ. And as we look at these verses this morning, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will inspire us, will teach us. Open our hearts, open our eyes, because this morning we want to see Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 I'd like to take your seats. I don't know if you remember, but uh, as I began last week's message, I said uh, we, I'm coming to the end of chapter 3 and we'll move on to chapter 4 this week. Um, well, I got to look at the last few verses that I thought kind of said the same thing as another place, uh, and as I was reading them, I, I felt, I, I can't leave these out, I've got to do these, I've got, I've got to bring what these verses are saying this morning to our attention, because as we look at these three, again, it's, yes, a little bit of the same thing, but I really felt that this may be God's way of saying, I, I, want, I want you to continue with this theme. And so when I started John's Gospel, as we did, I don't know, seven, eight weeks ago, I introduced the message, the theme of John's Gospel. And if you remember, the text that I used was chapter 20, verse 31. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. If you didn't underline that or you didn't look at that at the time I want you to turn to chapter 20 this is right at the end of John's gospel this is almost you know the last chapter the so next to last chapter and commentators believe this is the theme of the whole of the gospel and so I, I introduced it and brought this theme talking about this verse and what it means Again, as I come to the end of chapter 3, there's things in these verses that remind me of the message, of the theme. These things are written. What are these things? Remember, we're at the end of the gospel. These things are all about Jesus Christ. They're all about Jesus. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's it. Spells it out right there. These things about Jesus, we've already looked at some in the first three chapters. That he's the Lamb of God. Remember, John acknowledged when he saw Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God. <clears throat> we saw about Jesus that he began his ministry and turned water into wine. Then it talks about him overturning the tables in the temple. How he'd gone into the temple and they were all abusing God's house. Telling them they've turned his father's house into a den of thieves. And then Jesus confronts a religious man called Nicodemus. Tells Nicodemus, forget your religiosity. Forget all the stuff that that describes who you are. 
member of the Sanhedrin, a very religious man, very respected and highly thought of. None of that matters, Nicodemus. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God, let alone get in. You can't even see it. Can you imagine Nicodemus receiving that? And then we heard about him healing people, miracles, and we're going to hear lots more. Next week we start in chapter 4. He meets a Samaritan woman at the well. We'll read about him walking on water. We'll hear about him being the light of the world, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life. And we'll also read about his life, death, burial and resurrection. These things are written. All of those things that I've just talked about for one purpose only. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Amen. That's it. The reason I'm here this morning, the reason I'm preaching this morning, all of these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God. And that believing you may have life in his name. And so as I looked at these verses today, I thought, well, I'm going to start chapter 4. But as I look at them, and you'll see in a moment, they fit right in with this topic, with this subject. I couldn't leave them out. So many life-changing truths written here. And as I say, they fit nicely with the theme of the gospel. And so we need to look at them together so that it cements the need for every single one of us. Just in case we've not grasped it. Just in case we've missed it. Just in case at some point it's not hit home. It's all to be sure that you know that salvation comes from Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Nothing else. And of course this is also continuation from last week reiterating what John the Baptist wanted us to know about Jesus remember in verse 30 and if you've got your little booklets there John the Baptist said of Jesus he must increase but I must decrease John was pointing people to Jesus Remember, they were arguing that Jesus was getting more disciples than John. And John was saying, guys, you're missing the point here. This is now about Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's not about me, John the Baptist. It's not even about John the Apostle who's writing this letter. It's not about Paul the Apostle or Peter the Apostle. It's not about any worldwide evangelist, a Billy Graham. It's not about any of those people. It's not about the Pope. It's a, oh, thank you. It, he, he was nobody different. He was just in the list of nobodies. He's just in the list of nobodies. And I'm going to continue this list of nobodies when I'm going to say it's not about any pastor, including Pastor Eric. Amen. Right? That's where we're at. It's about pointing people to Jesus. It's Him and Him alone. It's not about you or I. It's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. And guess what? I'm going to look at this this morning. That's why it's entitled, Jesus is above all. Jesus is above all. So I'm going to look at John now as he <clears throat> gives us a number of reasons that Jesus is above all. So look at your text together as we see that Jesus is above all because he comes from heaven. Verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Jesus comes from heaven. And as we're continuing to, to hear this writing from John the Apostle, he now gives us a, dis a distinction between that which is heavenly and that which is earthly. What he's saying is Jesus 
came from heaven. John was of the earth. Because if you remember, it, it was this argument about John and Jesus and their ministries. You remember there were those who said that Jesus was, yeah, he was a good man. Jesus was maybe a prophet. Jesus was maybe a good teacher. And they will deny the fact that he could be both man and God at the same time. What this is saying is, there's no doubt as to the origination of Jesus Christ. From above. Jesus comes from heaven. And because of that, Jesus is above all. And this is not saying that the testimony of John is useless or it's of no value. But it's pointing out that it's got limitations. By contrasting it with the superior testimony that Jesus is from above. Yes, John the Baptist was a faithful witness of all that God had entrusted him with. But he was nonetheless human. He only had a limited understanding of the things of God. As do all human beings. As do anybody that's out there. Don't follow evangelists or, or these well-known people or pastors or, or any particular leader. Don't follow them. Follow Jesus. Look to him. Look to Jesus. Because Jesus came to earth from heaven, he is now back in heaven, having accomplished what God wanted him to do. You and I must believe everything that he's told us about God and heavenly things. John repeats twice in this verse, the reason being he wants us to grasp the importance of this, that Jesus comes from heaven because he is above all. Look in that verse 31, above all concerning Jesus, John says it twice. Jesus is above all because he comes from heaven. Secondly, Jesus is above all because he's got a heavenly message. Verse 32 and 33. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies. And no one receives his witness. But he who has received his witness has set his seal to this, that God is true. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies. This is talking about what Jesus is bringing. And that's a message from heaven. The message that Jesus brings from God is true. He's an eyewitness. And an eyewitness testimony is the number one testimony in any trial or any situation that you can find. Jesus is an eyewitness testimony. He wasn't speculating about God or heaven. He was speaking, yes, the very words of God telling us what the Father is like and how you and I can have eternal life. This is saying his witness is 100% reliable and certain. And again, as we'll see in some of the other chapters in John's Gospel, in John 7, Jesus says, my teaching is not mine, but is his who sent me. In John 14, I speak not from myself, but the Father who lives in me does his works. Jesus confirms that. And so if Jesus has a heavenly message, what are we doing with it? Well, verse 32 says there's two options. Some are not receiving it. Verse 32. Verse 33. Some say and accept that God is true. Some are receiving it. That's the reason Jesus came. That's the point and conclusion everyone should come to. That God is true and that Jesus spoke the words of God. Jesus is who he claimed he was. He's the Christ. 
the Son of the living God, sent from heaven to redeem us from our sins. Verse 32 of 33 gives us two options, acceptance or rejection. Those are the only options anyone has. And it's got to be personal. It's got to be the choice of every individual. You can't say, well, like I could. I, well, I was raised Catholic. I was raised Methodist. I was raised, I'm okay. I don't care what anybody was raised. It doesn't make them a Christian. It doesn't make them a believer. It's a personal choice. Nobody can ride on the coattails of our parents or our friends. You either say yes to Jesus and accept his message or you say no to Jesus and reject that message. Remember, I talked a little bit like this a couple of weeks ago and at the end of the message, I talked about the same thing, <clears throat> accepting, acknowledging who Jesus Christ was. And, and Matt made a decision. In his testimony, he said he had... One leg either side of the fence. He was straddling the fence. And that day he came down on the side of the fence that Jesus was on. Amen. That's the difference. That's the difference. And by the way, the heavenly message of Jesus has two God-given dynamics that should convince us that they're genuine. Look at verse 34 and, the, and verse 35. For he whom God has sent, that's Jesus, speaks the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without measure. It's the fullness of the Spirit. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. All things, all understanding, all authority. Jesus was fully human. We understand that. But what this is saying is he needed the fullness of the Holy Spirit as he ministered the message of God, which he spoke with full authority of God. That's what those two verses are all about. It's about the fullness of the Spirit and the full authority of God. If you remember, he began his ministry at the age of 30. We've looked at this in, in Luke's Gospel, particularly in, in chapter 4. Uh, many, many weeks ago when we started doing this in Bible study. Uh, just a few things about Jesus. As Jesus was going into the desert, it says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days. Jesus went into the desert full of the Holy Spirit. Then he fasted and prayed for 40 days. I, I, I don't know about you, I'd have been at my weakest right there. I'd have been on my hands and knees coming out of that desert. Tongue out my mouth, wanting water and food. and I'd have been like that after a day, never mind 40 days. <laughs> Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit going in. And then it says he had that encounter with the devil. And then in verse 14, as he begins his ministry, it says that Jesus returned in the power of the Holy Spirit to Galilee. He was in the full of the Holy Spirit to start, and he was in the power of the Spirit when he finished. Boy, if Jesus needed it, so do we. <laughs> You and I need it more than he does and did. But this verse 34 and 35 are telling us that you and I can depend on the message of Jesus that's, that's from above because he was full of the Holy Spirit and he had the full authority of God. There's a scripture in Ephesians 5 verse 18. I've quoted this many times says this, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. I, I'm not going to get into the issues of drink, good or bad, or indifferent. It's not about that. 
It's about saying as alcohol can affect your body and can control you, Paul said, that's not an option. Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. This is a different Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. This verse is now in the present continuous tense. It means keep on being filled with the Spirit. Let me just go back to when you're born again, when you come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit comes to live within you. Born of the Spirit. We receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and we're filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us. But like Jesus, when he was on his mission and went out to minister, full of the Holy Spirit, like the apostles in the book of Acts, many times it says, full of the Holy Spirit, they went to somewhere. How does that happen? We have to keep on being filled. We have to keep on asking God to fill us. We will never depart from being and being dwelt, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But you'll agree that sometimes as human beings, we kind of get run down. We kind of, you know, run on empty a few times. We kind of, you know, behave in less of the Spirit and more in the natural that we should do on many occasions. It's because the Holy Spirit's not present in a big and full way. And this is what's being taught. People are not taught this. And so when they receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in, they, they kind of like a car, they're running on empty most of their life. Because it's not cool to talk about the Holy Spirit. It's not, you know, a thing that, that a lot of churches teach. Because this Holy Spirit thing, it's a bit kind of, you know, it's a bit strange. Father, Son and Spirit. It's not Father, Son. Father, Son and Spirit. Three in one. Fullness of the Spirit. The reason there's so much turmoil is there's even Christians who are not full of the Spirit who are getting into it. Getting into stuff that they shouldn't be getting into. In this time, this day and age, with everything that's out there, the world is at it. It doesn't need Christians to be at it. We have to be moving in the Spirit. We have to realize that the devil is the enemy and he's trying to get in and infiltrate people's lives. Particularly Christians. He wants them arguing with one another. We're not to go there. If we follow the Spirit, the Spirit will lead us and teach us and give us words to say. You and I must be full of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was the example. The authority of God was upon him. The Spirit of God was within him. And as he brought the heavenly message in that way, guess what they did? They crucified him. They crucified him. I believe when preachers preach God's message with the authority of God, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, they'll be condemned and persecuted. <coughs> they'll be put down. They'll be criticized. They'll be called wackos or whatever. People say that they should be more accepting. More political correctness needs to come from the pulpit. No, it doesn't. It's garbage. You can't talk about sin anymore. You can't talk about people going to hell. Oh yes we can. It's biblical. Jesus taught more about hell than he did about heaven. Why? Because he didn't want those who were listening to him to suffer and go to a Christless eternity. Preachers must do the same. You know, I, I want to warn people of the dangers of not following Jesus. You know, I don't want to get to heaven and, and Jesus say, well, you, thinking I'm 
you know, I've done it all, I've done this, that. You, you didn't preach the gospel. You didn't warn them. There's a warning out there. You know, on every piece of goods or medication, they have a warning on it. They, they, they want to warn people of the dangers of taking something. Well, on this piece of documentation, there's a warning. Heed the warning, guys. As we minister to people, we want them to heed the warning. Because if they don't heed the warning, like with other things, including medication, there could be consequences. Could be consequences. I want to warn people of the dangers of not following Jesus. Which brings me to the last point about Jesus being above all. Because thirdly this morning, your eternal destiny hinges on a choice. Going back to this again, I've touch, touched on this, I know, five, six times. Maybe five, six times since, since December. What does verse 36 say? And this is what made me come back to these verses and talk about them this morning. One who believes in the Son has eternal life, but one who disobeys the Son won't see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. It's, it's biblical. The wrath of God is biblical. God's wrath is coming. The Bible tells us in the end times, God's wrath is going to be poured out on this earth. And for those who don't know God, his wrath is going to come upon them. And I, for one, I, I don't want any of my family and friends to feel the wrath of God. Looking back in, in the Bible, the wrath of God has been devastating. He's wiped out a whole human race apart from Noah and his family because of the wrath of God on the earth at the time. And by the way, the earth at the time is, is like the earth right now. It's disgusting, it's evil. It's totally against God and his commands. Totally against what God would, would want a righteous people to be living like. The wrath of God is gonna fall. But here in this verse, we're back to that word again, believe. And again, the bottom line is there are two and only two options. Believe in Jesus and have eternal life in heaven. Or do not believe and disobey the Son and you won't see eternal life in heaven. Amen. But God's wrath will be upon you. As I was looking at this verse, someone said of this verse concerning God's wrath, the ultimate consequence of failure to believe God's wrath. It's the ultimate consequence of failure to believe. These are both present realities that extend into eternity. Eternity can be had in heaven or eternity in hell. John is warning those who read this gospel, which is his message. He doesn't want anybody who's hearing the words of this message to make the wrong choice. While it talks about God's wrath in many places in the Bible, this is the only time in John's gospel. What does it mean? It means this holy God has a holy hatred and opposition to all sin. And all sin must be punished. But God could not be holy and just. See, it's not cool to talk about this subject. Yeah, well, there's a time when most preachers would pound the pulpit. Condemning sin the sins of the people and warning them of eternal fire and damnation. Repent before it's too late. Jesus is coming back. 
Well, let me tell you, that, that might have been in the 50s and 60s. Jesus is a lot closer now than he was back then. And when preachers preached like that, there were people run down the aisles to get saved. Because they didn't want to come under God's wrath and condemnation. Repenting of their sins and following him for the rest of their lives. So this morning again, as we close, I'm going to ask the question. I just feel this might be God reiterating, not one last time because I'm, I'm not going to stop preaching on this subject, but it might be a time that he wants us to take heed. Have you made the choice concerning your eternal destiny? Have you made it? You have to make it. Have you believed in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Well, the Bible says even the devil believes. He believes in his head all about Jesus, but he doesn't believe in his heart like the word of God asks you and I to do. The devil believes in Jesus, but not as Lord and Savior. You and I have to believe in him as Lord and Savior. And to do that, you, ask to, you have to ask him to forgive you for your sins. Then receive him into your life, believing that Jesus is Lord. Believing that he is Jesus Christ is above all. I believe God might say this morning, settle it. Settle it right now. Settle it. <clears throat> that you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Let's pray.